Good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome so many of you to the launch of the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, Net Zero Visions for the Devon Climate Emergency. Based at University of Plymouth and supported by the EDRF Low Carbon Devon Project and in collaboration with Devon Climate Emergency. We've got a really packed programme this evening. And so before we begin, I'd like to just mention a couple of housekeeping points. And this workshop is being recorded so that it can be a resource that's available on the Devon Climate Emergency website and other places. So if you prefer not to be visible, please turn your video off. We also ask that you keep your audio off to reduce the noise and interference during the event. And we welcome you to ask questions in the chat and my colleague, Emily Widdicombe from Devon Climate Emergency will respond during the event, or if a longer answer is required, we will direct your questions to those concerned after the event. The second workshop, which is taking place on Monday, the 21st of February, will be fully interactive, and my colleague, Dr. David Sargent, will say more about this later. So first of all, may I introduce you to my colleague at Low Carbon Devon, Rosie Maskell, who is looking after the technical side of the event behind the scenes. So I don't know, Rosie, if you can say hello. Hello, everybody. Looking forward to hearing from everyone today. Thank you, Rosie. And um, now I hand over to my colleague, Dr. David Sargent. David is Associate Professor of English at, in 20th and 21st century literature at the University of Plymouth. And he is the principal investigator of the Net Zero Visions project. So I welcome everyone and hand you over to David now. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Um, yes, and to echo that welcome. So I'm based at the University of Plymouth and I've been working for several years now with people from all kinds of backgrounds and fields on how people can use the imagination of, of the future in their lives. Um, and with Emma, I'm heading up this project. So I guess I'm gonna speak for the next couple of minutes on, on why net zero visions. And I'm sure many of you here already have your own answer to that question. Um, it might be that we live in a dystopian age where we're conditioned from to everything from the news we read to the films we watch to think that change is impossible unless it's for the worst. And so we need, more positive visions of what comes next. You can't live in a better world till you've imagined it. And that's that's at the heart of the project. And that's true, true enough that people in all kinds of places around the world and different projects have used the imagination to generate and shepherd actual change in their communities. But I want to, um, I guess zero, net zero, if you will, uh, I'm sorry. Net zero in here on some more particular advantages to imagining a net zero future where you live. Because I think that the, the fact we need to change, even things like the Devon Carbon Plan, they can start to feel like just more work, more stress, more bother, um, and also hopeless in that however much things change, nothing ever really changes. And so, you know, smog filled street down the road for me will always be like that. Um, those buildings will always be as they, they are. My neighbors won't know who I am and I won't know who they are because that's the way it's always been. It seems human beings are very bad at being able to believe things will change for better or worse. Um, and so net, net Zero Visions is a chance to, to take those streets and those buildings, um, to take the world you wake into and walk into and work into um, and make them different before your eyes in the most drastic and wild of ways in ways though that are possible and available right now so this net zero future isn't all uh you know pie charts about uh carbon emissions or eating dry pulses or cycling up hills um though i like at least two of those um but it's a future version of a world that we want to live in that's fun, that's more varied, more stimulating, more rewarding, more productive, um, so that we can join the kind of practical and sober projects we all know we need to carry out with this living and breathing vision of a world we actually want to live in, a place you make not just because you have to, but because you want to. And so the end goal being that 
we raise through Net Zero Visions, hopefully we raise widespread awareness of the Devon Carbon Plan. Um, we jumpstart a sense that meaningful change is possible for people and desirable, and then we take that energy and use it to help engage people in initiatives that are actually carrying out change. So many of us here tonight are in Devon, I'm sure, but whoever we are and wherever we are, whatever our background, we know that we're all in this together, um, that the benefits and the dangers touch each of us equally and touch our kids and kids that aren't even here yet. Um, and you know as well as me that well, it's not quite last chance saloon, that time is short. And we as a society, as a community, we won't get this time back. And so we have to make things happen very soon. So in the next couple of hours, we're going to hear from, from some experts on net zero transition, giving us ideas and inspiration about the kinds of things that can happen. We're going to hear from communities across Devon who'll be working with world-class creative professionals to realize a, a vision of their community that they want to live in, that's net zero. And we'll be hearing from those creatives. But I want to stress, and I'll stress again at the end, that the project is really open to anyone and everyone in Devon, that people will get a chance to submit their own net zero visions. And we really encourage people to take the idea, and take the act uh, into their own lives and just take it and run with it. Email us, tell us what you're doing, tell us how we might be able to support you. But together we might be able to build up a sort of mosaic Devon of the futures we want to live in. So I'm going to hand you over now to um, Emily Reed from Devon Climate Emergency, who's going to give us some background to the Devon Carbon Plan and Devon Climate Emergency as an organisation. Great, thank you. Just bear with me one moment whilst I share my screen with you. Thank you, David. I'm feeling all inspired and excited now. Um, so I'm Emily Reid. I'm the Devon Climate Emergency Project Manager. And what that really means is I work with a partnership of 29 organisations uh, that are already working on um, how we respond to the Devon climate emergency. So in 2019, um, organisations across Devon came together to ask how should we respond to the climate emergency and decided that they wanted to work together to create a resilient net zero carbon Devon where people and nature thrive. And to do so, they recognised that we'll need to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 at the latest and improve the resilience of Devon's environment, but also our communities who need to be prepared for a warmer world. And you can see on the right there, the organisations that are in this partnership um, and they include all of the local authorities uh, as well, including Torbay and Plymouth um, and the district councils uh, and environmental organisations, utility providers, emergency response uh, organisations. So it's a really broad partnership. So what does net zero actually mean? Well, it means Balance, it means achieving a balance between the greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere and those taken out. Uh, so greenhouse gases are um, gases that are produced when we burn fossil fuels primarily. Um, so when you put petrol in your car uh, and you get exhaust fumes out, that's a source of greenhouse gases. Plants can absorb carbon dioxide, one of the greenhouse gases from the air, and that means that emissions can be removed from the atmosphere um, by, by planting trees or restoring peat bogs. And so we need to have the activities that emit greenhouse gases and the activities that remove greenhouse gases in harmony to achieve net zero. So the partnership appointed an independent net zero task force. It's got 15 specialists chaired by Patrick Devine Wright from the University of Exeter and also one of the authors on the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. And they are producing a Devon Carbon Plan to say how 
um, and when Devon can become carbon neutral. And this is a plan that sits below the national plans and um, is a strategic overview that works with the, the district uh, council and organisational plans. So, so far in developing the Devon Carbon Plan, there's been an evidence gathering phase. So there's a, a public call for evidence um, where anyone could submit uh, their ideas um, and uh, 859 people responded to that. There was a youth parliament event uh, with uh, 15 schools and 75 students and thematic hearings, which is a sort of round table um, events that brought together experts to say, what are the barriers and how do we overcome them? So from that evidence gathering phase, the task force drafted an interim Devon Carbon Plan setting out uh, their recommendations of, of what needs to be done to achieve net zero. But they also within that signposted to some things that needed further public conversation uh, because they were controversial or more challenging. And those topics went to a citizens assembly <clears throat> uh, in uh, July 2021. So we've had a public consultation on the draft interim Devon carbon plan and we're in March having a public consultation on the partnership's response to the recommendations of the citizens assembly and these documents will come together as a final Devon carbon plan later this summer to be adopted by the partnership. So uh, here's uh, a snapshot of the Climate Assembly, which had to happen uh, online due to the pandemic. So what are we trying to reduce to net zero? Well, um, buildings are our largest source of emissions, uh, followed by transport and then agriculture. Uh, this is for Devon, Torbay uh, and Plymouth combined. Uh, so um, within buildings that includes the electricity we use and sources of heat, for example, gas um, and agriculture, uh, a lot of it is from uh, cow's digestion of grass feed. So we can summarize the Devon Carbon Plan in eight points of what we need to do. We need fossil fuels to no longer be an energy source. Energy consumption needs to be minimal. We need community action through a net zero Devon. And uh, any carbon from fuels that we can't avoid burning needs to be captured so it doesn't add to uh, the atmosphere. We need to, to prevent uh, any greenhouse gas emissions escaping. Uh, so, for instance, they're used in refrigerants sometimes, and so we've got to maintain those properly. We've got to develop a resilient local economy and resources have got to be used more in a more circular manner, for instance, recycling. And we need to maximise natural carbon storage through planting trees and restoring peat bogs, for instance. So you can find out more detail about what we're doing through our website and um, keep in touch through our social media. And there's also tips for you to look at if you want some inspiration. So hopefully that's given you a bit of context. So um, I think now we'd like to find out a little bit more about who's in the, the Zoom room today. So we're gonna have a poll that should magically appear. I would like to know if you're a resident of Devon. And we'll just um, have a few moments. Great, so we've got a few people who, who aren't, but the majority of us are, so collectively we can dream up the net zero Devon we want. And there's another question as well. So are you a member of a local climate or environment action group? Or would you like to be?
So we've got a good mixture in the room of people who are already involved in a group uh, and uh, some who would like to be. So that's great. We're in for an interesting session. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce you to James McKay, who we're delighted to have here. Uh, he's been dubbed the man who draws the future. He's an artist and an illustrator who works with scientists to help communicate their research and help us visualize it. So he paints both ancient and future worlds. Um, and he's, he's uh, led some really large collaborations with hundreds of school children, uh, artists, scientists, and community groups to produce visions entitled Dreams of a Low Carbon Future. And this included a graphic novel depicting uh, a zero carbon UK in 2150. So um, I'm delighted to hand over to James. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and get my slides up. Can everyone see that? Okay, great. Um, so I have uh, about 15 minutes and I'm going to do a whiz through my slides. I've got far too many, um, but uh, hopefully it will be an exciting uh, trip through um, the last 10,000 years and into the future. Um, so um, as um, Emily just introduced me, I work with scientists um, to communicate future visions, uh, especially positive future visions. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on tonight. Um, so I'd just like to show a picture that I'm very proud of that explains a bit about my work. So this is the sort of work that I've produced with scientists, uh, which became a picture on the cover of Nature magazine, which is one of the top uh, science journals in the world. Um, and this is actually to do with climate in that scientists had discovered uh, a subtropical rainforest at the South Pole, which was growing during the time of the dinosaurs when there were huge um, rises in greenhouse gases uh, naturally. And um, it meant that um, the poles were covered in, in forests. And um, it just shows you that, um, you know, the, the world sort of finds a way to deal with uh, raised temperatures and raised greenhouse gases. Um, but remember that in these times that there were millions of years when plants and animals had time to evolve uh, to those kinds of conditions. Uh, so this is the kind of work that I do with, with scientific groups. Uh, this is a picture of me working on that image. So I'm in my studio uh, working on the research behind it. So lots and lots of different versions. James, of the... could, I, could I interrupt you? Sorry, one moment. I think um, some people are, um, we're not seeing the slides in perhaps the way that you want us to, we're seeing the um, the, the PowerPoint program, and then we're, the image isn't changing. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. So, can you see the picture of me in my studio? No, we're still on a dream of a low carbon future. We're still on the first slide. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening there. Can you see it now? James, you might need to change the window you're sharing, I think. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Okay, can you, can you see that? That looks better, James, thank you. Okay, and if I go back, can you see that? Yes, that's changed back to the first slide, thanks, James. Great, okay, uh, so sorry about that. So yes, this was the, the picture of the ancient forest. 
And this is a picture of me working on that image. Um, so I have a background doing um, comics and concept designs for uh, lots of different projects. So these are pictures of uh, ancient um, worlds and science fiction worlds that I worked on. Um, and in particular, I worked on a, a series called Flesh for 2000 AD, uh, which was about cowboys rounding up dinosaurs. Um, and it was very uh, silly and violent and ridiculous, but it actually was uh, quite a, a fun satire on globalization and environmental destruction and degradation. Um, so um, that sort of was part of my uh, my interest in, in uh, environmental work as well. Um, so my work has all been about positive futures. So this cartoon by Joel Pett um, is really sums it all up. Um, it's about creating a better world. All the things that we do to tackle climate change will result in having a nicer society to live in. Um, and so we've got every incentive to go for that, even if it wasn't um, in order to tackle climate change. But obviously we have the, you know, the, the incentive that if we don't do anything, we'll be in a really bad position. Uh, this is um, some images from the projects that I've led. Um, some of them were funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering, who have a, a really great scheme where they team up artists with engineers and scientists. Um, so we worked on uh, these graphic novels, which are available to download. Um, you can find some of the links in the program that Emma shared um, on my uh, biography. Um, but uh, we worked, we went, went with hundreds of schools, loads of communities. And the important thing was the children worked with the scientists as equals. So they were sitting around a table with um, really senior world leading scientists, with students, with members of community groups, and everyone was there as an equal. Uh, this is a, an example of some of the images that children came up with, um, showing their sort of ideas about uh, fantasy, science fiction technologies and, and uh, their really cool um, thoughts and, and, and visions. Uh, these were children who were about 10 years old, 10 or 11, so really impressive. Uh, so those were the, the uh, graphic novels that I've worked on and um, that kind of project. And this project um, is called the Longlands Common Nature Reserve, um, which is uh, a local to me. And we've basically raised uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds to buy an area of greenbelt land to turn it into a nature reserve, mainly in response to the whole area being under threat from a road, which was seen off by the campaigners. Um, and my work on it is practical in terms of, I do drawings about what goes where, but it's also visionary in that we try to inspire people about what the nature reserve could be in the future. And this image, was used um, on their campaign um, to inspire people to invest in the project by buying shares. Um, and it worked really, really well for that. And throughout the campaign and the work that we've done it, uh, my work has been used to describe to people what things could look like in the future um, and really sort of interactively, iteratively working with loads of, loads of groups to go through all of that. Um, and my work has been highlighted by Rob Hopkins, who I'm sure everybody here will know. Um, so he uh, created this book, From What Is to What If, um, and it, I'd really recommend it to anyone. Um, he talks to loads of different people about their visions of the future and how they use art to do to uh, create their, their, their imaginative, creative visions of the future. So I'm going to do a quick run through of, uh, of my take on, on history. This is unashamed from a, an artistic point of view. So it all begins with humans using fire. Um, and 
obviously there were many reasons why we invented the use of fire, but the really important one is that it enabled us to change the landscape. So there's a lot of evidence to show that prehistoric peoples really altered the balance of the Earth's ecosystem even before modern technology um, by setting fire to large areas and in that way enabling their hunting to be easier, um, changing the conditions to, to suit them. And I would argue that it was from that point, it was inevitable that we would get into this current mess. And then we uh, invented farming, which has been called the worst idea in history. So we went from having a nice time running around um, in nice environments to being trapped in one place, uh, backbreaking labor, poor health, loads of diseases. But importantly, it meant that we could build up surplus food um, and that meant that you could feed larger communities and the elites could control those surpluses. So that led to the rise of empires. Uh, so we see big empires spreading across the globe. Um, and at that time, each empire was a, it was a zero sum game. So if you wanted to grow your empire, you needed to get energy and resources from somewhere else, which was usually controlled by another empire. So there were wars between empires or each empire had to go out and colonize new areas to bring back those resources. And if they couldn't find any, then their empire would collapse. It might not take, it might take a long time, uh, but they would be doomed. But then we had the industrial revolution and we found the new fossil energy resources. So civilization was no longer a zero sum game. It meant that we could grow massively our technology, um, our populations, improve health, um, but also massively increase our impact on the planet and releasing greenhouse gases from the ancient uh, uh, remains of the plants that um, composed that, that coal and oil and natural gas that we used. Um, then we had the, the second industrial revolution um, where we found oil and natural gas and, and link them up with things like the internal combustion engine. And then um, we developed ways of using fossil fuels to um, create chemical fertilizers. So using the Harbour Bosch process, which has been caused the, called the, the detonator of the population explosion. So we were able to go from a population of 1 billion to 7 billion uh, in around a century. Uh, so now we've arrived at the Anthropocene um, and it's expected that more than half of the world's population will be living in cities by 2050. And it's worth bearing in mind that cities are inherently unsustainable. So if you think about the amount of land that, well, the, the number of people that that amount of land could su support sustainably, um, it's very, very small. So all cities in history up until now have existed by exploiting a hinterland or colonies in order to bring back resources that don't exist within that city. So I think that this sort of highlights the fundamental problem with civilization, but also, uh, so, well, lots of people have pointed that out before, particularly environmental art, uh, writers like Derek Jensen. But I think my hope is that we now have the knowledge that we've never had before, which will enable us to create the first uh, cities and civilizations that are sustainable. Um, so I wouldn't be doing what I do if I didn't have that hope. Um, and you know, I believe that, that we can do it. It is feasible. It's not even particularly difficult if we can find the will. Um, but obviously it is uh, worth bearing in mind exactly what kind of a problem we we're up against. So it's been called a super wicked problem, which is a, a kind of a technical term. So it just, it doesn't mean that it's a, uh, really horrible. Um, it just means that there are certain definitions of wicked problems. Um, so obviously everything is intertwined. The key thing is that we're making it worse at the same time as we're trying to solve it. So when people laugh at, at an environmental activist for flying to a 
climate change conference um, and call them a hypocrite. That's all part of it. You know, I, I'm doing things at the moment that are unsustainable, but I'm trying to solve that, that problem. Uh, so we have to kind of appreciate that, um, but not get bogged down by that. The other thing is that it's, it's a slow motion event and very uncertain. So um, if you think about a meteorite impact, we would be able to deal with the meteorite impact much better because it's an external threat and it's got a specific timeline and we would know what to do. Um, that's despite things like that uh, recent film called Don't Look Up where uh, I haven't seen it, but apparently uh, it, people don't deal with it very well. But I think it's more of a, a satire on climate change than it is about a realistic um, depiction of tackling a meteorite. Um, the important thing is that, yeah, that it's so uncertain and, it, and it's slow motion, so we don't see it happening around us day to day. So here's a, a dark future. Um, I often get asked by scientists to create different scenarios of different futures. Um, for particular areas. So this is Leeds. So in sort of four stages, there's the failure to take action, which opens us up to greater and greater crises uh, in the environment. And then those crises begin to overwhelm us so that we're spending more and more of our time um, trying to fight over resources. We lose the ability to coordinate action internationally. And at that point, there's very little way back. And then things get a lot worse and we lose the technology to measure and understand what's going on. And then finally, we have collapse and fragmentation and we can't go back because all easily energy, accessible energy sources are being used up. So people in, in that situation would, would have no real way, way back into civilization. And we find that fascinating in the same way that a car crash or a natural disaster is fascinating. And obviously you can see that in films and Hollywood um, productions. But I also think that it's basically lazy. It's lazy thinking. We know what a bad future will look like. We don't really need to imagine that. It's around us at the moment. If you look at Syria or, or Yemen or Afghanistan, whereas a zero carbon future requires all of these things that I've highlighted, imagination and creativity, which are all the things that we're really good at. But the, the caveat is that whereas the bad future is just one vision, the good future, there are many visions and we have to try and reconcile lots of different people's ideas. Uh, so that's a big challenge. These are some of the things that um, we've discussed in the graphic novels and, and artwork that I've done. Um, I won't go through all of those because I'm sure everybody here is, is well aware of most of those, but I would, would say that I'm working with a group at the moment um, who are doing a massive project where they've looked at how to um, provide public services to um, everybody globally in order for everybody to have a decent standard of living. And they found that with huge investment in public services, it's possible to bring the global south out of poverty um, and using 60% less energy um, than is predicted that we'd be using in the future, so which would be amazing. Uh, so this picture is a, a vision of where I live at the moment in Yorkshire as a future society. And this picture has struck a chord uh, it's been used on loads of websites and book covers, I guess, because it's it's sort of almost like an overview of lots and lots of different things happening at the same time. Um, so, yeah, this one has really seemed to inspire people. Um, I've had loads of different community groups and, and artists and writers uh, wanting um, to use the picture for their own projects. Um, so it's a case of, I think, probably this is one picture where I've had the most influence on, on different groups uh, right across the world. Um, and then there is also, um, when we're talking about climate change, it's not just the, the mitigation, the reduction to net zero, it's also the adaptation to the warming world that uh, David talked about earlier. 
so this picture is a nice one by John Swagger, who's a, an artist friend of mine. Um, and it shows the, the mitigation, the, the reliance on renewable energy sources, but also the, the defences against the rising sea levels. Uh, this is a, a picture I was commissioned to do in Leeds, uh, where there's serious flooding issues. Um, so artwork can be used to show the different um, the different options available to us. So we have on one side the flooded city with rain rushing off the moors, and on the other side uh, tree planting and built buildings of swales and all that kind of thing. Um, and really importantly. Um, my visions um, have all been of real places, so it's I'd caution people against getting carried away by creating sort of net zero visions um, from scratch. Um, it's easy to draw a green city that looks lovely um, or a wonderful um, commune or, or something like that, but if it's not situated in its landscape and with the historic buildings and the infrastructure that's already there, then um, it's really not sort of saying very much. Um, so we've always done that in the projects that I've, I've led. Uh, this is a shot of Harrogate, um, which uh, is near where I live. And there's a, a big public park called the Stray, um, which is jealously guarded by a really big community group. And they keep it flat like a bowling green um, with no life on it at all, apart from the occasional tree. Whereas I've rewilded it here, um, and this was guaranteed to cause outrage among all the uh, the, the people involved. Um, but it, it certainly set off some really good conversations um, at an event that we had last year. Uh, these are illustrations uh, of a book that um, I produced for Professor Paul Chatterton at the University of Leeds called Unlocking Sustainable Cities. Um, and again, they're all based on Leeds, so they're they're sort of uh, based on the, the infrastructure there at the moment and then adding a layer of um, net zero um, infrastructure over the top. And this is me uh, doing what I seem to do more and more of um, at the moment, which is being invited to um, different festivals and events where people will get me to do, draw a vision of their community as a net zero community um, and do it live in front of everybody. So it's a great engagement tool. Uh, some of them have been about this size. Some of them have been the size of enormous murals. Uh, I'm doing one at the moment in central Leeds, which is about sort of 50 feet long. Um, so uh, yeah, they're a really great tool to get people inspired and engaged. Um, and then this picture is of Leeds, which was asked to do uh, live for an interview with BBC last summer. Uh, so I was trying to draw the picture and do an interview and cope with a torrential downpour that was soaking into the picture and making all my paints run at the same time. Um, but actually the interview turned out really well. Um, you can uh, find it if you, if you Google Leeds City on a Mission and my name. Um, and in that, I kind of summarise my approach to uh, concentrating on, on positive visions. Um, and so my final slide is basically just to say you don't all have to be an artist. Um, you don't have to be a creative, but use your skills to help where you can. Um, and if you're doing something that motivates you and brings you pleasure, you'll you'll carry on with it rather than um, thinking that you have to do you know, really horrible uh, jobs in order to, to help your community do that. Um, and that taking action um, is the best treatment for uh, the anxiety and despair that many of us feel. Uh, so thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, uh, some of the work of the other artists that have uh, been included in the schedule. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe talking later. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much, James. That was moving and, and inspiring and I think has got my imagination firing and hopefully I imagine everyone else's. Um, 
So lots of food for thought there. Uh, so we're now going to hear from uh, our expert panel who will uh, again help us to sketch out how places and communities across Devon uh, and beyond can become low carbon and address their their environmental impact so they'll they'll focus on different areas as we go through uh, aligned with the uh, themes in the Devon carbon plan so first of all we're going to hear from Bobby Hughes uh, Bobby's going to be providing a range of ideas about how Devon's communities can engage with the Devon carbon plan theme of economy and resources Bobby is a senior waste management officer at Devon County Council and uh, is heavily involved in supporting communities uh, to, to take action on, on local resource use. Over to you, Bobby. Thank you, Emily. Can you hear me all right? We can. Excellent. All right. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let's hope the tech works. Right. Hopefully you can see that. Excellent. Yeah, I can see some nodding. That's good. Um, right. OK, so, um, yes, I work as part of the waste team, but I'm talking about the economy and resources um, because there is a very strong link between uh, our growing economies and waste. Uh, unfortunately, there is a huge amount of waste coming from, from our, our growing economies. Um, but we need to break that link and move on my slides there. Um, we need to break the link and shift away from this linear economy to a circular economy. And I'm sure many of you on the call will have heard about the circular economy uh, already, but um, there's a huge amount of work to achieve it. Um, the, we need to transform our understanding of waste and recognize the huge resource that it is. Uh, there's so much embedded carbon um, uh, within our, our resources that we, we need to, to sort of realize I mean, it's 45% of global emissions can only be tackled by changing the way we make and consume products and food. Um, and the global food systems contribute 30% of global emissions with a third of food being lost or wasted. 8% um, of global greenhouse gas emissions come from clothing, clothing and footwear. Um, and even 3% of emissions come from plastic packaging. Uh, I mean, it's amazing when you start to look at it in those figures. Um, and we tend to think, have this narrow focus on, on just, oh, we have, must recycle more, but actually recycling is only a tiny part of the answer. We actually need a, a much bigger uh, systems rethink. So the circular economy has many benefits, many, many benefits. Um, it will help us to design out waste and, re and, and design in reuse and repair models. Um, we, we need to upskill and reskill the workforce, and there are huge opportunities within the circular economy to do this. Um, potential for new jobs, green growth, keeping resources in circulation rather than the sort of throwaway culture that we currently have, and we can reduce our impact on nature and the climate by by bringing in the circular approach, and so help economies and communities to thrive. And and this, this term build back better would really mean something if we could create this this circular economy. So I, I get the joy of working with lots of community groups and, um, and, and they're driving change all the time in their local communities. So, you know, when, as I say here on the slide, when communities come together, great things happen. And there's just a list there of some of the projects that are going on in communities all across Devon and across the country. Um, so we have uh, a whole range from food surplus cafes, libraries of things, um, eco hubs popping up. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of them, not too many, but uh, so I've got a very short space of time. So repair cafes, I have a particular love of repair cafes. I, I've run a few myself um, in my own, own community. Um, they're a great example of where um, communities come together, skilled volunteers that give their time and expertise for free, and they fix other people's broken items. And as part of that, they're, they're passing on skills as well and, and helping to teach others. We currently have about 15 repair cafes in Devon but there's more setting up all the time and we support those cafes wherever we can to, to set up uh, and they do fix a very wide range of things depending on the, the volunteer pool because they, they are uh, volunteer run um, they usually run monthly but they can vary a lot um, but uh, the great thing about repair cafes is they're really challenging this this throwaway culture and making people think about how they use their items and how they can reuse them and repair them and, um, and it's helping to um, engage industry because uh, and legislation because legislation is changing to allow people to repair things. We've seen those shifts happen in the last year or two. Um, 
uh, and uh, so repair cafes uh, and they, they, they offer so much more uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on it's not just about fixing stuff but they can help fix communities I believe as well in so many other ways Community fridges are another wonderful project that's popping up. There's loads of them popping up everywhere and we've got specific projects to help with the community fridges. So if you've not come across a community fridge yet, they are um, publicly accessible community fridges and larders where surplus food, often from local businesses, but also from homes, uh, is put into those uh, fridges and larders because it can be in sort of ambient space as well. And they're free for everyone to, to help themselves. It's, it's not about how much, you, you know, it's not about need for these particular fridges. It's about just cutting down surplus waste. We currently have 14 known community fridges, but actually there's loads popping up all the time. And there's a lot of overlap with um, food banks and, um, and the COVID has really highlighted the need to better manage food and, and, um, and the food poverty issues. But from my, our perspective, it doesn't have to be about food poverty. It's just about minimizing waste. Um, Anyway, there's loads of fantastic projects there. They're setting up all the time, far, far more of them. Um, I shall, oh, I've got some words missing on that one. There we go. Um, other projects setting up. Um, the, the picture on the top right hand corner is uh, Nikki Scott, who some of you might know, who's the composting guru in Devon. He's talking, he, he went um, to the Bishop Sainton uh, Sustainable Bishops uh, um, event and he talked about home composting and uh, worked with the, the community group there. And uh, the picture below is a community composting site. So there's lots of potential to, for community groups to engage in composting, managing food waste more sustainably. Uh, food waste actually makes up 30% of our dustbins, our residual bins, which is ridiculous, but it does. Um, so we need to tackle food waste um, at source and get people composting more. Uh, and uh, community groups are a great place to do that. And they link really well with food growing projects as well. And uh, a lot of interest in food growing projects. It's going to be very important moving forward uh, into a more sustainable future. And um, another sort of uh, project that's also taking a lot of people's imaginations and, and turning into realities is, is libraries of things. And libraries of things are wonderful. They are um, projects where basically you can borrow stuff <laughs> and it's great. Um, so rather than having to have that, that um, carpet cleaner in your cupboard you could borrow one instead and lots of families can benefit or people can benefit for, from sharing stuff which is brilliant and the network of well-being set up the first mobile share shed so hopefully hopefully you know about it but some um, but based in Totnes and it travels out and around uh, that area um, and uh, it's a brilliant project and, and there's a lot of interest in setting up more libraries of things and they the network of well-being and the share shed have been very good about sharing that information with other communities. And then I just wanted to talk uh, very briefly about the fact that um, there are some projects that have been around for a very long time tackling the waste resource issue, actually. And I, I thought back because I've been in waste management for quite a long time now. And these are just a few of the projects that have been around, some of them since the 1990s. And they are fantastic examples of community based projects that are making a difference. Uh, and I particularly like Proper Job. I mean, all these projects on this slide are brilliant. But, but Proper Job is a really good example because um, they've helped to springboard small businesses and um, enterprises from themselves, from, from their own enterprise. I mean, they're a charity themselves. Uh, but they only became a charity a few years ago. Uh, but uh, there's potential in all these. They also all these community projects here employ people. So a lot of the earlier community projects I was talking about, a lot of it relies on volunteers. But actually, out of those ideas and those community projects come um, the potential, the potential for creating um, community interest companies and uh, small enterprises that could help to start to help us relocalize our economies and to start to use our resources and keep our resources more local. So uh, if you get a chance to start to look at some of these projects, I highly recommend looking at them for ideas for your communities, uh, both the, all the community fridges and repair cafes, but also these long standing projects that have been going for 20 odd years because they, they've learned a, a few things over the years. And so just my, my last slide, because this was only meant to be a very quick talk, um, is that these projects aren't just about being green. Um, they are place based and people focused which I think is absolutely key to the success of projects. They bring people together and strengthen communities, which is why I love particularly repair cafes because the, the sharing I've seen going on at repair cafes is wonderful. Um, they enable us all to share our skills and learn new skills. And, um, and I think that really does benefit people's well-being. We're trying to find ways to capture this better because you know people who engage with their communities and do things generally have a better sense of well-being. They can help to tackle isolation. Uh, we find a lot of 
um, people who come to repair cafes, they come because not because they want to save the world or, or be green, but because they absolutely love fixing stuff and they love sharing that ability to fix stuff with other people. And whatever the reason that brings them through that door, it, it starts, uh, it creates an environment where people can share ideas and talk and create that new, that new future. So I think a lot of these projects, um, once they get themselves up and running, they also inspire other communities to take action and you get this sort of ripple effect across communities. Um, the repair cafes and community, community fridges have been particularly good examples of that of, of recently in the last couple of years. Uh, and as I, I sort of mentioned earlier, with some of those longer standing projects, there's that potential to create local jobs and community businesses as some of those older projects have, have you know, are still doing now as they continue to, to thrive and grow. And I think also a lot of these projects uh, in communities that they're, they're providing leadership in their own communities, they're, they're helping to paint that better vision, that new idea, that new way of thinking. Um, so I, I hope that, that all of your communities will consider ways of tackling their, their resources and their local economies through, through thinking about waste differently and how they can tackle that locally. Great, thank you, Bobby. That's brilliant again to, to see images of communities already taking action and uh, looking like they're enjoying it in the process very much. So. Um, and I must say, I recommend the Share Sheds um, party set if you need 60 plastic plates and cutlery, it's very useful. Um, so uh, we're going to hear from Ollie Franklin next, who's going to be sharing approaches uh, to uh, about how Devon's communities can engage with the Devon Carbon Plan's theme around energy supply. Ollie is a project manager of electric vehicles and innovation with Regen. So over to you, Ollie. Brilliant. Uh, can everyone hear me? And is that working, Emily? Just quickly. Fantastic. Um, yes. Actually, Good Ollie, evening, you're everyone. Still, you're still on the. Um, we can see the sort of the back end of PowerPoint, as it were, rather than. Classic. Hang on a second. The ongoing joys of Zoom. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Thank you. See all of it now. Great. Um, so I'm just going to spend five minutes doing a, a whistle stop tour uh, through energy supply. Uh, which is my area of expertise. Um, and so, sorry, introduce myself, Ollie Franklin uh, from Regen. We're an independent not-for-profit based in Exeter. There is around 30 of us now uh, working to try and decarbonize the energy system in lots of different ways. Um, and I haven't got time to go through them because uh, I've been given five minutes. So I will try and stick to that very diligently. So, um, First off, so uh, yeah, I've, I've structured it in, in, in kind of four sub themes that are in the Devon interim carbon plan, um, which were focus areas. So um, I, pro apologies, it's probably not as visionary uh, as, as some of the other presentations we've seen tonight already, but I, I'm trying to kind of do a kind of status quo slash what we should be doing perhaps in the kind of near term rather than in the kind of futuristic or, or visionary approach in where we want to be. Um, but so first off, it's kind of we really need to use less energy. Um, and as Emily alluded to, it's the main two aspects that we need to reduce our, our buildings and transport, particularly. And uh, the graphic on the right there is around so the buildings aspects. I'm not going to cover this in very much detail, but broadly, um, it's heat pumps and it's insulation. And this is a, a kind of a graphic of energy sprung type solution, which does a whole house retrofit in one go, uh, manufactured off site, um, reducing the kind of impact uh, on the on the uh, household um, and gives a, a kind of net zero house in one fell swoop rather than doing an incremental approach over a long period of time. Um, so that, that's kind of one way we can kind of do it for buildings. We need to kind of carve off how much energy we supply to buildings and also make buildings able to supply energy or uh, produce energy through solar panels, for example, on that, that one there. Transport is another one. Um, obviously, moving towards more active transport, walking, cycling. Um, obviously, I've, focused, I've got a quick small picture there on, of co-bikes um, in Exeter, shared electric bike scheme really useful uh, way of um, reducing the, that energy use is by shif shifting to active travel and also electrification of transport more generally. So if we use 
public transport next so our buses and trains need to be electric and then uh private car use needs to be electric as well so just i won't steal um uh, my other other experts thunder any more on that the other kind of sub theme that comes out in the interim devon carbon plan is that that kind of the real need to transition to renewables even more than we already have done there's been a fair a fair crack at the whip in terms of the power system we have got a good amount of wind particularly on the system particularly offshore wind recently but we need to now look again at more onshore renewables um, and particularly as we electrify transport and heat um, so more heat pumps uh, more uh, electric vehicles we, we really need a lot more generation and i think one thing that devon has got which i, I see some friendly faces in the, in the kind of the list here is, is a fantastic community energy uh, network and group that's been very active over many many years and this is kind of a, a very high level map of some of the kind of key uh, case studies that we already have in place um, and i'm not going to go through them all but i'll just pick plymouth energy community who have done at least one solar farm and are planning another one on an old landfill site so that's a fantastic use of brownfield um, land and we're producing lots of renewable energy so those kind of examples and I, I think we should be well aware of the kind of the benefits of having community owned or locally owned by the local authority um, renewable energy assets it's not a commercial entity that kind of gets that revenue it's keeping all that other revenue in the local economy and, and trying to get the benefits of that it's a kind of educational opportunity um, there's lots of other social benefits for for having kind of community or community owned um, assets so i think that's one thing to try and strive for is as much community owned assets as we possibly can um, go for and then the third point there is local supply tariffs and options be, and other options being considered so if we can generate locally can we supply it locally and, and there are that can be very challenging <laughs> and there are lots of kind of impediments for doing so but there are some nice models starting to kind of crop up um, energy local clubs there's a few of those um, starting up and i believe there's a there's a plan for kind of a, a devon electricity tariff of some description so trying to um, nestle uh, the supply of energy um, closer to hand and ideally match it with the local generation of electricity is going to be crucial and that's really got to be part of our vision in terms of the future future electricity supply system or power system generally and to deal with all that new renewable energy that's coming on the system we're going to need a lot more flexibility and energy storage um, so the kind of this is a very high level graphic but broadly it shows the change from the current energy system which is very top down large power stations um coal fire power stations predominantly previously and nuclear and, and the, the kind of going down the system to our homes gradually and um, we're moving to a much more and are in the process of going toward, towards a decentralized system where we have a lot more producers small scale producers medium scale producers of energy but i think the, the key to the key thing to focus on is that a lot of those uh, the, the demand side that they need to be flexible in how and when they use their electricity and helpfully uh, the electric vehicles and the heat pumps that we're moving to are very good sources of that flexibility that can be used in the home and in businesses um, and so we can um, charge our electric vehicles at, at times of the night when we've got lots of wind on the system for example soak up all that wind that we'll have on the system so there's really good uh, uh, opportunities there for for flexibility and the second point there around energy storage so we're going to need a lot more energy storage which is kind of a crucial technology um, mainly battery storage at the moment but there's other uh, really interesting technologies coming along including hydrogen um, liquid air energy storage as well which is a, a kind of a new one as well um, flow batteries so uh, having that ability to soak up excess renewable energy generation when we overproduce and then also uh, export when or use it locally and um, when we when we need it more um, to kind of deal with our own uh, demands on site and in our local communities is going to be absolutely crucial and the last uh, theme or sub theme within the interim Devon Cumber plan on energy supplies is potentially looking at how we can pilot carbon capture and storage. And there's two big energy from waste sites in Devon, um, one in Plymouth and one in Exeter, and they seemed like the best uh, points to in which to try and pilot carbon capture and storage. 
quite a long way to go until that can happen. Uh, some big changes in technology are needed and some redu- reductions in costs. Uh, but that's that's on the cards, as it were, in the, inter- in the first um, draft of the interim Devon Common Plan. So apologies, whistle-stop tour of energy supply. Lots more I could go into, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Great. Thank you, Ollie. That was a really helpful overview of um, how we need to change our energy supply going forward. So uh, now I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Satish BK, uh, who's going to be discussing how Devon's communities can engage uh, with the Devon Carbon Plan theme of the built environment. Satish is uh, Associate Head of School uh, Teaching and Learning uh, at the School of Art, Design and Architecture uh, at the University of Plymouth. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Steve, to uh, introduce yourself in more detail. Thank you, Emily. Could you see my screen? We can indeed, that looks great, thank you. Excellent, thank you. And uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I can go for this presentation two ways. One is just this one slide, because if, if I think about this more and more, uh, all I feel is it's the difference between our needs, wants, and greed. And if we all stick to our needs, probably we don't have to have any further conversation. It, it's that part of the requirement of us as humans in terms of our aspirations, our values, and our culture, and how that informs our uh, consumption is what drives most of my research. And uh, uh, particularly, uh, I might be going tangentially today in terms of uh, uh, trying to chart the trajectory of uh, what the national, international challenges, what we're facing, but more so how that could inform uh, some of the initiatives, what the Devon community could uh, look forward to. So uh, probably you might find me going completely off the track. Uh, uh, I'm sure all of us have seen this. Uh, uh, and this is something which I feel like keep coming back to because that 0.5 degree uh, global warming makes huge impact and it's, it, it, it impacts all walks of our life and more so for the built environment because uh, it's the displacement of people, it's, it's the uh, 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 rising sea level and its impact in terms of the cities or the, uh, or the places where we live it is what uh, really makes the difference when we talk about the uh, built environment. And uh, uh, needless to talk about these figures, but uh, these are the striking ones because if, if you carefully look at it, we are talking about nearly half of it, or the 40% of uh, uh, energy consumption of the carbon emission is coming because of the built environment. And that's what makes this particular uh, uh, sector um, more important. And if that is at the global level, in fact, it's no different at the national or even at the Devon level uh, as I check the latest figures and uh, we are consuming uh, uh, rather emitting nearly 42 percent of the uh, carbon and uh, the challenges what we face here in terms of uh, our built environment is uh, uh, quite complex because uh, uh, as you could see uh, later on in my slides we are not uh, looking at one aspect or one dimension in terms of whether it's just reduction of carbon emission but it gets quite uh, as uh, uh, James uh, very beautifully articulated, quite complicated in terms of uh, quite a few factors are coming into picture. Uh, on the brighter side, uh, looking positively, um, if you had asked me the same question two, two and a half years ago, uh, I would have been in a completely different position to answer in terms of where we stand, in terms of the profession, in terms of the uh, uh, practices, in terms of the uh, uh, professional bodies. But uh, things have changed in the last two years. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, some of these um, uh, key professional bodies like uh, Charter Institute of Builders, uh, Royal Institute of British Architects, and they have all come with a very useful and uh, uh, quite appropriate and relevant uh, guidelines for their uh, professionals. And uh, uh, in particular, say the one which I'm referring to here, the RIB Sustainable Outcome Guide, is extremely useful if, if you are looking at any of the new uh, buildings or uh, built environment in terms of your uh, uh, cluster neighborhood or uh, at the uh, village or uh, city level. Uh, because it, it's quite evident if we don't do anything, if we continue uh, as usual, uh, the impact what it has to, if we can take measures, how we can really bring down our carbon emission and really achieve the uh, uh, net zero by 2050. And that, that's quite important for us to appreciate. And uh, uh, I'm going back to this again, because 
when we look at some of these built environment issues, um, as much I want to think of zero carbon, uh, it, it's more complex and it's, it's quite, uh, again, um, uh, intertwined with quite a few factors. And a, a good example of that is when you look at the sustainable development goals, uh, nine of the 17 goals are being part of the uh, architect's day-to-day -day work. So that, that clearly shows uh, we can't think of some of the other uh, uh, sustainable agendas or issues uh, when we uh, are as much we are talking about the reduction of carbon emission in our day-to-day -day, uh, building works or projects. So if I have to, or probably if you want to think of one thing you want to take away from today's my presentation, I would probably say this, uh, if at all, what would be the future strategy for us? And I would literally say build nothing would be the best strategy. What I mean by that is, uh, th this is where it goes back to the very fundamentals of where I started my presentation from. It's how, how far we can repurpose, refurbish uh, the existing, uh, or adapt the buildings to our uh, uh, today's or tomorrow's needs is, is the order of the day. And that's what would uh, ensure uh, we could be carbon neutral or zero carbon as, as the day goes by. And as you could see the inverted pyramid here, uh, the next in order would be build less, build clever, build efficiently. Uh, though we talk more about the waste, but that's the tip of the pyramid and that could yield us a very relatively limited uh, uh, savings compared to uh, restraining ourselves from uh, unnecessary construction activities. Uh, what I mean by that is, again, uh, there are two folds to this. One is in terms of trying to understand what we really want or need. And on the other hand, in terms of the per person space required, for, what is actually really required for us and are we doing much more than that? I'll come back to that uh, slightly later. Uh, again, if I could uh, take that one step further, uh, uh, there are quite a few uh, research happening now, which, which articulates this particular factor a lot more clearly. And um, in simple terms, I can um, classify this into two parts uh, in terms of the building uh, carbon emission. One as a sort of uh, operational carbon and the second as the embodied carbon, that is to say, to build, we, uh, we would have uh, consumed energy and to operate, we will be consuming energy. And uh, it's in that simple sense, uh, uh, and again, getting the sequencing in terms of ensuring that we build such a way that we ensure the building needs least amount of energy. So that's what we call it as passive architecture or passive technology or passive uh, uh, means and modes of uh, uh, running the building. So if we can ensure that we don't need energy to run the building, that's the best way of looking at how, how we can uh, make our future sustainable. If not, ensure the building is act using the active strategies, that is to say, how you could make it as, uh, uh, or rather uh, zero carbon in terms of the uh, 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 technology, what you use and ensuring that the operation becomes zero. And similarly, when we look at the embodied energy, it's, it's about again, going back to the transformer reuse and build less, build clever and build efficiently. And of course, there is this last option of certified offset and uh, uh, personally, I would say, don't even think of that because uh, that's, that's not the way ahead for us. That probably may, uh, probably some uh, flights or uh, charter people may think of offsetting, but not if, if everyone starts thinking of that, that's, that's not where we want to end up at. Uh, if we focus, uh, again, uh, looking at the brighter side of it, uh, this is a really good uh, graph, which clearly shows you uh, it is possible and we, we can achieve it. And I think that's, that should be the positive approach and attitude from which we can go forward in terms of, and as I said, since built environment uh, looks for nearly 40% of the carbon emission, and if we can manage that here, uh, I think we will be a lot more successful uh, as we go forward. And the best part of this is, uh, uh, I mean, as much I don't believe in a top down approach, I, because I firmly feel it, it's the participation, it's, it's the bottom-up approach what gives the maximum result. But in this particular case, it's, it's equally important for us to see what the policy interventions are, at what stage, in terms of how, how we can get the benefits uh, at, at those key stages. 
And uh, this would be a really useful tool for us to start understanding how we can really achieve from where we are now, 180 uh, metric ton of carbon emission to literally bring it down to zero uh, and using those key strategic policy interventions at those uh, decades or uh, uh, years uh, as it moves. Uh, there is one myth. I, I can't say myth because that's a fact in terms of uh, anyone I speak to or ask for uh, though they can understand, and, and this also goes back to the psychology of uh, uh, consumption, we all believe in, uh, understand, believe, and want to do, but we won't do because it costs more. Uh, and uh, the uh, construction industry is no different to that. And uh, actually, if we think about that, yes, it costs more to start uh, in terms of the initial investment, but if you carefully look at the overall bigger picture, uh, actually it costs less over a period of time. It's just a matter of time and it's just getting that right is what it matters. And uh, I, I just stopped there because that particular intersection where the, the uh, initial cost being higher to uh, the sustainable low carbon features what we can adopt in our buildings, it depends on the element or, or, or the component which we are talking about. And some of those could have literally two or three years, some of them may have five or six years and at most 10 years of uh, time for us to overshoot the uh, uh, cost, what, what we are talking about. A uh, couple of more slides, if that's okay. I might have taken more time. This is again, just to give you an idea how if we are uh, clear and smart, we can easily achieve these goals by overlapping this onto the uh, RABS plan of work in terms of how each stage is of the, at each stage we can reduce our carbon emission. And again, it happens more so at the pre-design at the client spirit stage. And when we interact with the clients and we talk to the community and when, when those things are sorted out. And I just thought I'll show you, it is possible and it is uh, not necessarily uh, uh, done for the sake of doing it. It could be beautiful and it could be aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, I'll just leave you with a couple of these uh, conscious of time in terms of uh, uh, you. There are uh, quite a few works happening at the national level. So some of those, again, uh, as you could see, it, it all always goes back to highlighting on the uh, using the existing uh, building stock. And uh, that's where the key lies. And I'll just conclude by talking about this one aspect. As I said, I keep coming back to this, that uh, as much we talk about uh, net carbon, it's not just about the carbon emission, what it matters when we talk about the built environment. It's, it's about the other further dimensions in terms of the, what I would call it as environmental and social sustainability. And for me, uh, uh, though we, we talk a lot about, in fact, even I teach a lot about the fabric first approach in terms of how we can reduce carbon emission. But I sincerely urge we start thinking about uh, the human-centered approach. We start thinking about the health and well-being, the happiness of the people in the spaces what, what we create and generate because 90 to 90 percent of the time we spend in these buildings. And if you are not happy, if you are not healthy, uh, it just doesn't make sense for me to think of uh, zero carbon. And uh, the best part is that both can be uh, uh, not contradictory, rather complementary. And most of my work now is uh, actually looking at those, the impact of uh, uh, ventilation impact of the way we live and how that makes the difference in terms of uh, are we considering our culture, our background, and how that would have impact in this uh, 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 sustainable houses and schemes to uh, follow uh, uh, in my most recent RIB research project. I'll stop there. And this is a useful tool if you want to uh, look at for further uh, understanding of uh, net zero operation carbon. So, thank you. Great, thank you, Satish. That's, that's been a really helpful uh, contextualization of, of putting the built environment sort of in relation to the other themes in the Devon Carbon Plan, particularly. It's, it's good that you followed Bobby talking about resources and, and sort of how we need to use our resources, and, and Ollie talking about energy because uh, you've just brought those together really well, talking about the built environment. Um, so, thank you, that's really helpful. Um, so now we're going to go to Professor Stuart Barr, who's going to be unpacking how Devon's communities can engage with 
um, the theme of transport. Stuart Barr is Professor of Geography at the University of Exeter um, and uh, is going to yeah, help inspire us as to what we can do here in Devon. Okay, great, thanks. Can you see my slides okay? Yep, they look, they look good, thank you Stuart. Brilliant, thanks very much. Thank you for the invitation um, to say a few words here. Um, and I want to talk about um, what is another one of those um, wicked policy problems um, that was referred to earlier, um, which is transport and mobility, which is so central to the way that we live our lives today. Um, and which we know that accounts um, in Devon as other parts of the UK for a, a very large amount of our carbon footprint. And I want to take inspiration from uh, what the first couple of speakers said, which is really that we, we do have a lot of hope here. And I think we can be very optimistic because not only can we deliver benefits for the climate, I think we can make our own lives and the places that we care about so much, um, Devon and where you live in Devon, much better. So the, the, the kind of message I want to send is that we can improve our lives and we can live and move better um, through also helping the climate. And um, hopefully I'll show you a little bit about how we can do that. Um, the images you see here, some of you will recognize that the right hand image on the slide is from Four Street in Exeter. This is one of the occasions that um, they had various activities in the street on a Sunday afternoon. And then some images on the left hand side, the top left one probably recognize that's um, from the Netherlands. Um, and then the bottom left actually from North America, where there's actually been a lot of work in trying to deliver the idea of what they call new urbanism, which is getting people living back in town and city centres um, and making the street their home, which, of course, is so common in, in the south of Europe. OK, so, um, how can we do that? Um, five practical things I'm going to talk about in, the, in terms of the way that we might achieve um, that kind of hopeful vision. Um, talking about individual services, employers, communities and places. So we're going to start off thinking about the ways that we might change our own behaviours, but then very rapidly moving on, because I think there's often a little bit too much focus on just what the individual should be responsible for. And we need to move much more towards a community facing collective approach that I think looks at the places. And so I'll build on a little bit of what Satish was saying um, earlier. OK, so our own behaviours. Well, at the moment, we know that there are all things that individually we might be able to do. And as communities, we might want to think about the ways that we could encourage individuals to change their behaviours. I think we need to recognise that some people have better opportunities to do this than others. They might be close to certain kinds of infrastructure. They might have the disposable income to invest in certain kinds of low carbon and technologies like electric vehicles um, and so on. So um, this will work for some, uh, but it won't work for everybody. But there are certainly things that we can investigate that, that may apply to some in our community. But what I want to focus on is what we might do together, what you might think about in your communities. And the first idea is to think about our services. Um, and we're very used to talking, aren't we, um, in local politics in particular about local services and the critical importance of things like bus services, which I think we, we really need to upscale uh, and, and to create a really valued public transport network. Um, but Ollie also touched on this idea of mobility as a service, the idea that we might be able to rethink the way that we own mobility technologies. So at the moment, we live in a world where really everybody wants to own their bit of metal. They want to own their own combustion engine, their vehicle, their bicycle. Um, and organisations like co-cars and co-bikes are innovatively challenging that idea and saying, well, actually, we might be able to share mobility uh, devices, mobility technologies, because what counts is not really the ownership. It's the service that it provides, which is getting around and getting around in a low carbon way. We might also think about whether we need to move at all in certain circumstances, something that we're all very familiar with with the pandemic. And certain digital technologies enables us to work more flexibly um, as we're doing tonight without having to meet face to face. 
But then as the top left image um, here points out, there are certain mobility services that are really important to people's health and well-being. Um, so we ran a workshop um, with some stakeholders in Devon about six months ago, and they told us all about the real importance to people's welfare to reduce isolation uh, for those who may live on their own, particularly those who uh, are in um, elderly communities, and the importance of getting on the bus to go to the health centre, to go to the shops, to meet people. So sometimes we'll be able to substitute mobility for digital technology. Other times we do need to. We need to think how we can do that in um, the lowest carbon way possible and also to reap the benefits for sociability in, in mobility. Thirdly, we can do a lot in our communities to work with employers for people who do that daily commute. Um, here are some examples that we already have in Devon. We've got uh, the car sharing scheme. We've got the national cycle scheme, which provides a way for people to get um, a reduced cost bicycle if they use it for work. We can obviously work flexibly. And the bottom right image, we can also encourage employers to put in the kinds of infrastructure that will enable people to cycle or walk to work. So having showers at work, having safe and secure bike storage, um, all those kinds of things can often make the difference between people making the decision to use a more um, active travel mode like walking and cycling or sticking with the vehicle. So I think that's really important. But the final two are the ones that I think really open up major opportunities uh, for, the, for those uh, attending this evening. The first one is to understand more about what the needs and demands are for our own communities, what the transport inequalities might be. So who has access to certain kinds of transport and who doesn't. So making transport accessible, not only physically, which, of course, is absolutely critical, uh, but, but also in terms of financial um, issues as well. Um, and. What I would say here is improving for our own communities the sociability of mobility that makes it good for our physical and our emotional health. So some of the images you see here in my street, I'm in Pennsylvania in Exeter, the top right. We now have um, we, we close our street for a, a party um, every month. So everybody can come out and play, although I think it's mostly focused on children, but it transforms what the street is. The street should be for people. It should be a sociable space. It shouldn't be a space where we as humans are relegated to the pavement. We might encourage young people to cycle to school or college in a, a cycle train rather than being taken um, in a road vehicle. We might encourage people to improve their mental and physical health by joining walking groups, which don't have to do 20 mile hikes. They can just be sociable walking groups around the neighbourhood. We might want to encourage people to join community running groups like the park run, particularly if people are working more at home. So there's all kinds of things that we can do to inculcate a culture of being on the street and moving actively, which is good for our physical and emotional health. And then finally, this is what I'm really passionate about as a, as a geographer, a human geographer, someone who's really interested in places and how they work and how we can improve them. I think there's so much we can do at the local level through lobbying and our planning system and the ways that we make decisions about the places that we build and how we, we retrofit places. We need to move away from the idea that our towns and cities are dominated by the vehicle to make them dominated by people. So the, the two left hand images see a big contrast. Top left, classic housing estate that we will see built, being built around many areas of Devon. The image below it, albeit from Freiburg in Germany, but it shows how you can still have high density living but, it, but sociable space is created. That bottom space, I think nearly everybody would agree they'd rather live there because of what it looks like. And likewise, on the right-hand side, a contrast between some of the really dysfunctional um, public transport infrastructure that we have all over the county compared to high quality infrastructure, which shows that that is valued. And if it's valued, people are more likely to engage with it and use it. So thinking about how we can make places better places to dwell that people don't necessarily want to move away from so reducing travel demand creating streets that are for people and in so doing improving the quality of our own lives 
Last um, slide is this one, just some further examples from a great book, if you're interested in following it up, uh, called Designing the Compassionate City by Jenny Donovan, who is an architect based in Australia, but did a lot of research here in the UK. And again, these contrasting images where she says, well, actually, you send signals through what your places look like. OK, so you can suppress the demand for public transport or you can increase it. You can make places welcoming and inclusive. You can make places uh, feel very foreboding and exclusionary. And we can we can work with the planners in our county to do this. And we, we so we know the answers. That's the hopeful message. We can do these things. They've done in other parts of the world. But we really need to get beyond the idea that it's just about trying to persuade people to cycle a bit more often. And we need to transform places so that we reclaim our streets for people. OK, I'll finish there. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Stuart. That was a really sort of nuanced uh, message. And it was really good to, yeah, to take that multi-pronged um, approach of what we need to do. And a hopeful message of the benefits that, that we can have for our communities. Thank you. So uh, finally, uh, from our... Uh, expert panel, we're going to hear from Jill Westcott, who's going to be discussing how Devon's communities can engage uh, with food, land and sea uh, as a theme. Uh, Jill is co-chair of Transition Exeter and a director of New Prosperity Devon. Okay, can you hear me? We can, Jill. It's doing that thing again where we can see the, the back end of your slides, as it were. That Any better? better? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't get into them otherwise. Anyway, there, there we are. What would a net zero carbon food system look like? So maybe the pictures will um, tell the story. This is on the left, a community feast, which Transition Exeter organised for people to bring food from within 10 miles. It was all vegetarian and it was delicious. So for our future diet, the, the biggest way to cut our climate impact uh, and probably our ecological one as well is eat less meat. And of course, uh, the meat that we do still eat can be better. Uh, produced with respect for animals and planets. So we've got quite a few good suppliers of meat already. And you may be familiar with Piper's Farm, uh, West Town Farm near Exeter, Chag Farm serving their local community in Chagford, and some of them do meat boxes. So um, rather than this. In our net zero city, Everybody who wants to could grow some of their own food. And at the moment, they can do that by joining Exeter Growers Co-op and just go and do some work and take some produce. On the left, we have edible, uh, incredible edible Todmorden, who have adopted urban spaces for food growing. Uh, there's a beautiful south-facing wall in the police station. They didn't ask to grow tomatoes, they just did it. We're prepared to ask forgiveness, but not permission. Uh, let's go and carry on. Community orchards, um, also opportunities for wonderful community events, apple pressing, wash sales, tree dressing, and so on. So looking now at agriculture and what we do in our fields, to be more resilient, it certainly helps to have more diversity of crops rather than monocultures. And agroecology is a way of working with nature to provide some of that diversity and protect the soil, sequester more carbon and make, make it more productive. So this guy, I hope you can see him, Andy Gray, his neighbours were horrified to see him planting trees in a field, beautiful red earth. He said you can grow anything there. But he pastures there and he says it'd be better for the soil, for the animals, uh, and it'll help them withstand droughts, which we're going to have quite a lot more of. Um, our town would be surrounded with small, um, rather labour intensive farms, possibly, but producing food at quite a high intensity, like Shillingford Organics near Exeter, which delivers food boxes. And they got so much extra help during lockdown. People in, enjoyed it. 
in Liège, the transition movement has really encouraged their small farmers and has a wonderful, enormous food market that people go to. And maybe our cities in Devon could have that too. Exeter would love a good food market. Uh, these are the conditions which would help us to have that uh, hinterland of productive, prosperous and non-polluting food. But one of the big obstacles is getting land, as some of you will know. For people who want to grow food, there are three ways of getting land. Apart from an allotment, you inherit it, you marry into it, or you become a hedge fund and earn lots of money and buy it. Otherwise, there are relatively few tenancies and it's really difficult. You can buy a field, but you won't be allowed to live there unless there is a one planet living policy. Uh, and this is a lifeline to people who want to grow food on a small scale. So I believe Dartmoor National Park now has one. Uh, so Dorset was one of the pioneers, uh, as was a place in North Wales. So the, these two families bought 40 acres and under the policy, they were allowed to build a removable building, which would leave the land intact if it was removed and had five years to prove they could make the relevant income, which they did. And they're now allowed to build a house. So it's uh, a mixed farming, uh, again, quite labour intensive, producing fruit, vegetables and dairy products. And they also talked to the other smallholders roundabout, got together and built this uh, traditional uh, crack timber barn with help from English heritage. So this helps all the smallholders to process their food and market it. They make Windsor chairs in the top butchery, apple pressing and uh, bottling plant in the bottom in a shop. And in the uh, basement are huge vats of cider. I don't know how they drink so much. There's Jyoti with her cheeses. Um, these are some of the things that farm support could provide. And in our uh, zero task force, we've really heard about the need for unbiased and helpful one-to-one -one advice for farmers, as well as signposting what national policies can give them grants for ecosystem services. A lot of small farmers need marketing support um, and the, the cost of labelling whether food is polluting or not, shouldn't really fall on the cleaner producers, it should fall on the more polluting producers, which is the opposite from now. Tamar Grown Local is another bunch of co-ops um, in the Tamar Valley in the um, border with Cornwall. And they too um, help, they have a honey co-op with um, equipment to use. They have shared growing spaces and work days. Uh, shared marketing and uh, apple processing. They also have starter units for new growers, which they actually provide and support new growers to prove their enterprises where they can move on to um, better things. In the Devon Carbon Plan, we see the need for a land use framework which identifies which bits of land are best used for certain purposes. So we have farmers inveighing about growing maize at vast energy cost on slopes and ruining the soil. Some areas may be best for um, nature recovery, some for arable, some for permanent grazing, some for um, reforesting and rewilding or timber production. And it's helpful to signpost the grants that might be available for these things to the land users. So that's a concept uh, in process. And of course, it involves loads of consultation with the relevant um, people, owners and others. Perhaps we don't give enough attention also to our marine ecologies, which are crucial for sequestering a lot of carbon. Fantastic proportion of global carbon is sequestered in the ocean. And that is something of a problem because the ocean is becoming more acidic. But to start with, we need clean water free from phosphates. Some pet flea treatments are extremely poisonous to everything in water courses. And when dogs go in, then of course they, um, this gets into the water. Fertilizer runoff and sewage. So in some places, the um, West Country Rivers Trust is teaching citizens to sample and analyze their water. And in our net zero um, county, then I think the Environment Agency also has enough resources to police as well. 
we need to conserve our marine carbon sinks. So there are quite a lot of these, and some of them are at risk from current fishing techniques. And marine protected areas are not sufficiently protected from this kind of destruction. So things like kelp forests, seagrass beds, mussels do a great job of sequestering carbon in their shells. And also our coastal sinks, like salt marshes. So should we allow, as the sea level rises, our edge to come inland? That's a management issue and probably more discussion about that is needed. Overall, I don't know why there's this odd thing here, but anyway, what does the sea provide? We don't always know. So we need to know where our carbon sinks are and what our, our most productive areas of sea are and to be able to protect those assets and work with all the people who use them and benefit from them. And also we need to cut plastic waste because this diminishes marine productivity and it um, inhibits the ocean's uptake of carbon. So huge amounts of marine gear are dumped at sea. And we all know that we have to work hard to reduce our own output of plastic waste. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. That was a, a delicious and nourishing vision of the future that's probably all got us uh, musing on dinner. <laughs> Um, yeah, lots, lots to think about the changes that we can make there. So uh, that completes the introductions from our expert panel. Um, and I'm going to hand over to David now uh, to take us on to introducing our communities. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, um, that was great from all our speakers. We're running a bit over time, so we're going to kind of Move, improvise on our feet to make sure we try and get through things and time available to us but we're going to meet now the communities who are working with us in particular locations across Devon to realize kind of set piece visions where they live so I think we're going to have them spotlighted whatever that means on screen all together by Rosie I think that's working um and so we're just going to go around and ask people to say hi where they're from and some kind of key things about their location and their community um so i'll go around on the order of my screen meg could you start us off hi everyone i'm megan stell i am based at exeter college and i'm the personal development manager um, and a key role for us at the college is about engaging learners and that's a, a massive part of my role um, so i lead on our student union and also our um, uh, environment and sustainability group so the main thing for us is about em embedding it into our curriculum to obviously educate our young people and also to get our young people involved in all of our initiatives thank you jill hello uh, i'm from transition exeter which uh, is the local transition initiative so since 2006 and we support community action for uh, cutting carbon and making a, a fairer more sustainable city and uh, Megan if you've got students who'd like to be involved in us we have room for an intern or two. Thank you. Uh, David from Torbay. Oh you're muted. Okay, that's it. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, great, great uh, meeting so far, or great uh, workshops. And uh, my name is David Durant. I'm co-founder of Torbay Climate Action, based in Torbay. We've recently um, formed uh, CIC, went CIC to enable us to attract funding to develop some projects across the bay in 2022. One of them, which is the one we are working on immediately, is a carbon literacy project, which is uh, delivering, or first of all, developing and delivering workshops to the local authority and businesses and individuals around the bay um, in the you know carbon literacy to make them carbon literate, which means um, answering all the questions they have. Uh, not everybody knows everything about the climate or the carbon, mm -hmm. so that will answer those questions and will give them some. Um, opportunity to um, bring the changes into their own lives uh, to, you know, to reduce the carbon emissions, I guess. Uh, but yeah, we've got lots of other projects on the pipeline. This is exciting times really for us. 
great. Thank you. Can't wait to see what vision you come up with. Um, Andy from Ashburton. Hello. <clears throat> um, well, I was invited to be part of this with one of several hats that I wear. And the, this one is that I run Ashburton Art Centre, which is the old Methodist church in right in the centre of Ashburton, which for anyone who's not in South Devon is halfway between Plymouth and Exeter on the A38, just on the south edge of Dartmoor. Um, it's a fabulous big building in the middle of the town and basically every community should have a place like this because it enables us to put on all kinds of events. Um, I mean, our, primarily pur our primary purpose is arts, things, uh, live music, live things uh, of all kinds. And by having a building like this where we can uh, put stuff on, we can attract people from all over the country and all over the world to come and perform. Now, um, we can also use it as a community resource and I'm delighted that we uh, were able to help the first, the Ashburton Repair Cafe get started for their first year. Um, and uh, we also have the Share Shed, uh, the uh, library of things that was mentioned earlier, visiting our forecourt every, every week. Um, so it, it's that sort of resource that we're able to do and I hope we can also galvanize, um, galvanize the creative side of people um, in the town and around in, and um, have a bit of fun while doing all this serious stuff. Thanks Andy. And is Inga from Ashburton there? I feel you all have surnames but I'm just skipping. Hi, yes. Um... Oh, Been going. Um... Can you hear me? Yeah, you can now. Yeah, OK. I'm with Ashburton Climate Emergency, which was set up in 2019. Um, it's been a little dormant, I have to say, since COVID, but I feel like new life is coming back in. Um, and actually, listening to the presentations, I realised we have a very successful repair cafe and a very successful community fridge. So, um, you know, that's that's given us a bit of a base in the community. We're looking at doing more edible planting, um, inspired by incredible edible tree planting. And personally, having listened to the presentations here, I would love to see a community energy project because it's such a big issue around carbon emissions. And the, the, the tricky subject of transport is one that I, I wish we, there was something that we could do. We've had a couple of groups that have looked at it, but really it's such a hard one to crack in Devon. Um, so those are two issues I'd like to see us sort of visioning on in the future. But meanwhile, this has been really inspiring. So thank you. Thank you so much, Inga. Um, Max from, I have to read this, make sure I miss out none of the alliance, the five parish alliance of Wembury, Brixton, Yelton, Newton, Perez, Nosmeo and Holberton. Yeah, hi, my name is Matthew Chown. I'm the chair of the Environmental Alliance that has been created between five parishes in southwest Devon. So those parishes are Wembury, Brixton, Yelton, Holberton and Newton and Nos. Um, the five parishes already work closely together on a wide variety of matters and it was logical really to come and work together in a way that focused on the climate emergency. Um, working together as alliance has been really helpful. We've had regular meetings and we have ongoing communication with each other. We share knowledge, information and experiences and having this structure provides support and allows us to collaborate and achieve environmental actions much quicker and on a larger scale than if we were working alone. So we're looking forward to taking part in the Net Zero Visions and are really pleased to be involved. Thanks, Matt. Um, if we can move now to James from Biddeford. Yeah. Hi, I'm James Craigie. I'm a Biddeford Town Councillor and the uh, Chair of uh, the Decarbonisation and Environment Committee of the, the Town Council. Um, and we've been looking into lots of things since we declared a climate emergency uh, in 2019. Um, obviously, we've been looking at things. We've identified that the decarbonisation of heat and transport is the uh, biggest challenges we face. So we've got projects on at the moment looking at uh, using the water source from our, the, the River Torridge as a source for heat pumps and reconnecting Biddeford to the, the mainline train system. But we also recognise that it's not just a climate emergency, it is also a biodiversity emergency. So we have emphasis on uh, wildflower planting, but also preserving the Devon white beam which uh, currently exists pretty much only in the, the Torridge Valley, but it's something that used to be across the whole southwest. So it's something that uh, we recognise that we're 
it's a, it's a species that's retreated to, to just our area and, and we want to see it once again back in, in where it was more naturally across the whole of the, the southwest. Thanks. Uh, it'd be great to see that kind of detail in the, in the kind of multimedia visions we come up with as well. Um, Peter from Tiverton. Hi, I'm uh, Peter Stott from Sustainable Tiverton. Um, we run a number of uh, projects, including the rerouted surplus food cafe and community fridge, the Tiverton Tree Team, the Repair Cafe, give and take events, plastic free campaigns in Tiverton and Bampton, and a small green transport group. And uh, two years ago, during the lockdown, we were able to run um, an online art competition for schools based on the theme, what would a net zero Tiverton look like in 2030? We had about 100 entries to that, and I'm really pleased that uh, some of those students also want to be involved in this project, and we're really looking forward to working with them and with you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, and we'll also be working in Plymouth with um, Nudge Community Builders. I don't think Hannah is here, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but before we move on, just to say, so these locations, these communities and these representatives and other delegates from these places are going to be working with the creatives we're about to meet to produce these kind of very high standard, attractive, interesting visions of their location as net zero, net, uh, zero in 2050. Because time is ticking on, I'll move on a pace and hand over to Emma now and we can meet um, our creatives, I think. Hello, everyone. So we're getting onto the, the part of the programme where we meet the creatives that are going to be putting into action some of the visions that um, the communities are developing. And as James pointed out earlier, it's not about um, visualising um, something completely from scratch is about building upon all the good work that's there already and also looking at the infrastructure and the places and the, the people and how things are operating there at the moment. But the, the creatives are going to be responding to the, the ideas from the communities. And so we're just going to hear briefly from those um, artists and creatives and creative teams about themselves and also um, just a little snippet because they they haven't started the project yet so they don't know quite what's going to happen um, but they're um, just going to say hello and um, just so everyone knows who they are so um, I hand over to um, Alex Riley is that Alex in the room maybe we start with um, with Ashley Potter and team thank you Emma um, I'm going to share my screen obviously and hopefully you would have thought I'd have it ready by now, wouldn't you? Anyway, here we go. Can you see that? Which, whoops, says Sam Holland. Oh, there you go. All in one. Can you see that? <laughs> Um, so my name is Ashley Potter. I'm going to be the director of this and also um, art directing it. And I've got two of our graduate students, um, both amazing animators, Molly Noel, um, whose main sort of preoccupations are transitions and hand-drawn animation. Um, an amazing sort of sense of how you um, deconstruct scripts and dialogue. And Sam Holland, um, who is currently a, one of our MA students, who's passed... Um, Projects have always been about difficult subject matter, how to visualize those. He uses a lot of after effects within his work. Um, but I'm gonna show you a few pieces from myself. Um, I draw a lot, I draw a lot in um, sketchbooks. Um, obviously I'm a full-time lecturer at the moment, but whenever I get the chance, I'm out there with my sketchbooks, wherever I go. So this is um, Exeter's dog show um, in August just sitting there drawing people as we go along. So I like to capture sort of local flavors and, and people essentially. Um, nightclub in Berlin, um, swing pool in Spain. Uh, that was in France. Um, that again is in France. That's the Charlie Hebdo. We took a field trip out to Paris and the night before the Charlie Hebdo uh, atrocities happened. And so this is recording what was happening around us um, as sort of illustrators in Paris. Um, I've also worked in sort of demanding situations. Um, I had a sort of summer job in an eye hospital, Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, and that's some of the drawings that I was unable to do by the surgeons there. They let me in there with the sketchbooks, which is pretty cool, actually. 
Um, and just to end with my stuff, this is some of the commercial um, work that I've worked on. Um, as I say, mainly as an art director, um, but also storyboarding out. And then I've worked on directors for, as a director on several other projects for TV commercials, station idents, and short, uh, short length films like um, the Canterbury Tales. Um, so we've got Carmen the Opera uh, with the Welsh National Opera. We've got Care, um, the charity Care, which was founded around the um, Berlin airlifts. Uh, that's the Bank of Scotland who are trying to rebrand themselves. Um, how successful that is. That's for the post office when they were doing really interesting things. They've got a history of doing interesting um, animations. And that's a, a very simple sort of martini one. Um, then Molly, just an amalgamation of her work here. Um, unfortunately, she hasn't sent me anything which actually moves that I can share with you, um, but you can see it on her site. And then Sam has, has sent me stuff which moves. As you can see, he likes to work with sort of pictogram type imagery um, to dealing with a lot of um, inequality. Um, how do you talk about death within the family? So really hard topics to actually visualize, which I think he's done amazingly well. So we're really looking forward to working with you guys. Um, I've taken notes, pages and pages of notes here. Um, there is so much there to actually work with. Um, so looking forward to sort of having longer conversations. Oh, Sam, hi, Sam, you're there. <laughs> Didn't know if you could see me or not. <laughs> no, I couldn't earlier, but okay. Um, that's it from me, I think. That's enough time. Thank you, Ashley. We're, we're really looking forward to see what uh, you and your team will produce. Fantastic. Thank you. So if we pass on to Philip Harris, illustrator for the project. Um, Philip, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sure thing. Hi, I'm uh, Philip Harris. Uh, oh, just share my right screen. Here we go. Uh, is that coming up OK? Cool. So um, I'm Philip Harris. I'm an illustrator from Exeter. Um, I work primarily in the medium of dip pen and ink, which I started using when I was at university when I inherited a collection of my grandfather's old dip pen nibs. Um, as a commercial illustrator, I work in editorial packaging and advertising, um, but I'm always drawn back to kind of being inspired by the natural world and the local landscapes around me. Um, so working traditionally out in nature with my sketchbook is where I feel most comfortable and where I kind of find most of my creativity comes from. Um, a lot of the themes that I kind of explore in my work are sort of the narrative tales that wind their way through the sort of landscape of Devon. Um, for the Net Zero projects, I'm going to create a series uh, of illustrations looking closely at the communities involved and examine their landscapes and explore sort of what makes the areas diverse and unique to them. Uh, and that's it really, I'm really excited about the project. Can't wait to get started on it. Thank you, Phil, that looks amazing. Yeah, we're really looking forward to seeing what you produce. Thank you so much. Uh, if we can hand over to Alex Riley from Mutant Labs. Alex, if you'd like to describe what you're doing and, and your company, please. Sorry, I'll just unmute myself. I might share my screen quickly if that's all right. Uh, let me know if you can see that. And we can see um, the slide. Trend, but yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm from uh, Mutant Labs. Uh, we're a games company. Uh, among other things, based in Plymouth. I've uh, been running for about 12 years. Um, we predominantly um, create games. We do animation and online interactives, which is a fairly broad, loose term, but, but kind of creative software stuff is what we like to do. Um, we mostly work for clients in terms of building games for different brands and stuff, um, mobile and online. We've also, over the years, created a few of our own games as well. Um, one game about yak racing called Yak Dash, which was pretty fun. Another one about diamond heisting. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose generally we just try to find game projects and clients that are slightly offbeat or interesting or exploring um, concepts that, that are of interest to us. And we had quite um, a strong emphasis on R&D. So we set up this thing called Free Range Fridays where 
at least one Friday a month, we would work on our own projects outside of the client work that we were doing to try and keep creativity flowing. Um, so for Net Zero Visions, um, we're going to be creating a series of mini games. Um, these will be web-based. We're kind of looking at putting an emphasis on, on kind of quick fire, fun, engaging gameplay um, that, that you can kind of repeat play and get a high score and, um, you know, keep people coming back to play these. And these will be based on um, some of the locations. I'm really looking forward to working with the partners from um, the various locations of parishes that we're hearing from. Sounds really cool. Um, and we're going to try and represent those locations uh, in these games that we create. Um, and I think, yeah, having listened to the talks this evening, there's so much going on, so many interesting things to, to explore. And I'm really looking forward as well to seeing what, other, what the other creative partners come up with uh, in response to the, the briefs that they're working on as well. So, yeah, just generally looking forward to the whole thing and, and working with everyone. And it's quite interesting that we've kind of come full circle because our company was founded off a university project um, that was for the Eden Project as part of a student brief. And it was called uh, Crop Master Protector of the Green Earth. And you basically had to try and save the environment for a series of little mini games. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're kind of coming back to a, a, a really kind of familiar territory. So it's nice to be doing something like this again. Um, that's it. That's me. Let me see if I can unshare my screen. Thank you, Alex. I think it, it's super exciting to see the, the way that not only can the community sort of feed into the mini games and how they will work, but also um, how it goes forward and how they engage with the games um, through the leaderboard and how communities can um, begin to have see in the virtual world as well as in the physical world how their actions can, can have a beneficial effect. Mm. Fantastic. Um, Kate, um, Kate, Crawford, um, Precious Plastics Plymouth, uh, also a um, mural artist um, <laughs> and scientist uh, combination. Um, Kate, would you like to introduce yourself and, and what you'll be doing in the project, please? Thank you, Emma. Um, thank you, everyone. It's been a fantastic evening of talks. Um, so I'm commissioned to paint mural, murals on this project, which for me is just a dream come true, really. Um, it combines all my skills and my passions um, so I've been painting big murals since I was about 12. It's just the scale that I like to work on. I've also painted a lot of theater scenery around the world. And so I'm quite used to painting in kind of any style as well, which is really interesting. Um, but at some point I became really concerned about the environment. I came to Plymouth and um, studied marine biology, uh, looked at the plankton and how they would respond to future carbon dioxide levels. So I can approach this as both an artist and a scientist. Um, and I just, I, I think this is an inspired project really, that if we can envision the future, then we can change it. I, to be honest, I've never actually thought about it before, but when I did, I saw the power in it. Um, so I'm just really excited. So thank you very much for, um, for inviting me onto the project. Thank you, Kate. And your murals all over the county um, are already inspiring people so I think that this will be a, another um, another way that um, you can engage with people's visions which is is just brilliant um, so another part of the project are student commissions and so responding to Kate's murals the, there are three student augmented reality commissions which will bring um, Kate's murals to life in a different way and so people can engage with those and so we have three um, student commissions um, there's Lewis Horsfield who's here today who's going to say hello there are two further um, student commissions as well um, who are here in the background uh, they may be saying hello um, that is Aaron Orchin and Rosie Carter so they're all going to be producing very different um, works in response to Kate's um, visions. So, um, Lewis, over to you, if you'd like to say hello. Hello, I will share my screen. All right, does everyone see that all right? Yeah. Awesome. So 
Um, yeah, I am a third year graphic design student at the University of Plymouth. Um, I am also a freelance graphic designer. Um, I specialize mainly in motion design, um, but I've also done editorial um, illustration um, and some other bits and bobs branding. Uh, I've worked with a couple of uh, international um, people and personalities, as well as working with a couple of local businesses. Um, yeah, so that's me. I, I basically just make stuff. Um, this For this project, I'm mainly going to be doing transformative stuff. Um, I'm grateful to be able to work with Kate's art. I know it's just going to be incredible. Um, I can't wait to see what you produce. Um, I'm also the chair of the Design Society at Plymouth University. So we just do stuff like this when we get in Zoom meetings and we get uh, industry leaders in graphic design and motion design to give us some talks um, to part their wise knowledge upon us. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically me. Um, I'm glad to be a part of something that has meaning, has purpose. Uh, as a graphic designer, you kind of strive to have a little bit of meaning amongst all of the um, capitalism. So I'm glad that I get an opportunity to lend my hand to something that has a little bit more substance to it. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. That's fantastic. And um, in the background, we have Aaron Orchin, um, who is another one of the Augmented Reality Student Commission. So, Aaron, if you'd like to introduce yourself and Rosie, I think you're going to introduce too. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to introduce as well. Uh, hello, my name is Aaron. I'm a student at Plymouth University. I'm working on the game design course and I'm second year. Uh, my specialism is 3D art. So, for the murals, for the augmented reality. I'll be making models and animating them. And so for instance, if it was like bees and like flowers and things like that, I could animate the bees moving and pollinating flowers and things like that. Um, and Rosie is a digital 2D artist with a focus on game design and she'll be working with me to make textures for the models that I'm creating for the project. And that's basically it. Great. Thank you, Aaron. So thank you, everyone, all of the creatives. Um, so this is just the beginning of the project. We're just at the very start. And the next stage, um, David's going to talk to us about now and just uh, very briefly, because we're running over by a couple of minutes, but just to give you a sort of taste of where things are going next. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, all the creatives for, for coming and just saying hello to us and giving us that little bit of more inspiration um, for where the project is going. So I'll just hand over to David now. Thanks, Emma. I'll wrap up at, at top speed. So I won't say much. Um, we're nudging over, but I'm sure you'll agree it's worth it. Incredibly exciting to see all, the, all these places and things that are going to be happening. So uh, wrapping up, we'll be in touch with communities, representatives, creatives um, into the future. She's also stressed there's going to be scope for individuals to submit their own net zero visions and to be included in the project in that way to make your own um, in partnership or on your own as you see fit. Um, there'll be resources for that. We're keen for people to use this, um, schools as we mentioned, but in places they work, people they work with, friends. We want to see it kind of travel organically through Devon. Um, the website is up. There'll be more information and resources and materials continually added to that. So the web page is on the Diver Devon Climate Emergency website. So keep checking into those. Um, do sign up for the newsletter as well if you haven't already. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the information and ideas and thanks to all our speakers for giving up their time this evening. At one point we had a, a top of not, more than 90 people nudging into this Zoom room. Um, it would be really helpful to us if you could fill out a survey form to give us some feedback. It would take less than five minutes. I put the link in the chat. Um, and so I'm going to wrap up there um, just to say keep checking the website, look out for the newsletter and really look forward to seeing where this goes um everybody's earned a nice cup of whatever they fancy tonight i think um so look forward to seeing you into the future and yeah good luck and good imagining bye-bye